Today, I invited two of my entrepreneurial mentors, Dan Miller, author of the best-selling book, 48 Days to the Work You Love, and his lovely wife, Joanne Miller, to share the wisdom with us about the importance of entrepreneurship for kids. Because the two of them are successful entrepreneurs and literally, they raised a family of three generations of successful entrepreneurs. Now, I want to pre-warn you, in this video, we cannot go more real and raw about this. You will see this is not a super production video. This is about uh, real. It's these two mentors willing to come on the show uh, we met at a conference and we three squeezed in a small hotel room, used two share microphones, but create a golden content for you. So I hope that you will enjoy and cherish it as much as I did. I have a whole lot of this kind of behind the thing, but value bombs, so to speak, the content for you. If you like it, would you please share it and subscribe, hit that bell button so you will be notified when the new videos come up. Now, let's welcome Dan and Joanne Miller. Hello, Joanne and Dan. It's such a pleasure to meet you guys in person, um, especially here in New Media U Euro Conference. It's great to be here. It's a whole new world for us and we're enjoying it so much. Great to meet you too, Kelly. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Joanne. You know, a little bit background story here. Uh, I have been you know, following Dan for a while because I learned Dan, about Dan actually from Click Democrat. Mm -hmm. uh, he actually is a part of my story of how I started a podcast. Then, um, because I learned that you have a, such an impact on his recent transformation. So when I saw the campaign in your Facebook page, I saw that wonderful Joanne have a coming book called Creating a Heaven of Peace When You Are Feeling Down, Finances Are Flat, and Tempers Are Rising. <laughs> I think we have, we have all have those moments. So I told God, I said, wouldn't it be nice that if I can can interview Joanne, but she's so far away in America. But guess what? Guy is so good. I mean, he brought you all the way from America. I know. America. It's, yeah. it's, it's incredible that um, we've met all kinds of people over here who listen to Dan's podcast and who know about my book already and who have been saying that same kind of thing. Oh, it'd be great to get together. And here we are. So we're excited about it. It's, it's, uh, it we're having a great time. It's yeah, fun. yeah. You know, guys, it's not very often that two influencers in life and business are willing to be in your hotel room to be interviewed. <laughs> and it's because that their core value is really to inspire all of us to have a wholesome life in our entrepreneurial journey. So, Joanne, I really love the quote that you place in your website from Barbara Bush. Yeah, says, "Your success as a family, our success as a society." depends on not um, on what happens in the White House, but on what happens inside your house. So may I ask on behalf of our listeners that how long have you guys been married and how many children and grandchildren do you have? We've been married 48 years. And Dan, you want to tell why that's a significant number for us? Well, it is. It's kind of a landmark for us because 48 is part of our brand. 48 Days of the Working Love, my most popular book. So we made that the name of our company. So we've done a lot of things with 48. And we had a big celebration this year because we hit 48. Everybody celebrates 50 years of marriage, but we wanted to be different. So we had a big celebration with 48. We have three children, all grown. We have 14 grandchildren spread around the world. So we have a lot of great times together. And I'm sure in last 48 years is like totally smooth ride. No bumpy road, right? Of course not. <laughs> no, and in fact, that's why I had the subtitle in the uh, Creating a Haven of Peace because it's really easy to tell people, well, that if you just did this, then this would happen and everything would be smooth going. But we all know that that's not true. 
let's yeah. get real. And one of the things that I wanted to have um, be very evident in my for, it, it, 48 days, I started to say, in the Creating a Haven of Peace book is that in spite of your circumstances, in spite of your financial situation, in spite of whatever's going on around you, you can create that haven of peace. It's a choice. Just like loving someone is a choice, creating that haven of peace and sanctuary in your home is a choice we can make every single day. And there are steps in the book to tell people how to do that and how to just take little baby steps to begin with. But it starts with how you treat one another and the respect that you have in your home. You've talked about us being entrepreneurs. We love being entrepreneurs, but entrepreneurs a lot of times focus on their business. They're very busy and they're very intentional about their business. And sometimes other areas of their lives, they are not as strategic about planning success. We decided very early on that we needed to be just as intentional about success in our marriage as in our business. Mm -hmm. So just like creating a business plan, we've been very specific about what needed to happen in our marriage to make it successful as well. Realizing that the success of our business is really built on that. And if we lost that foundation, we'd be in big trouble. So we do real intentional things. I mean, not that we take the fun and spontaneity out of it at all, but... Mm -hmm. Things like respect and affirming each other's desires and giving time for things that are important. We've just done that since day one. We had some good role models, not in our own families, but in people that we chose to learn from, learning how to create a marriage that would last. Wow. So be intentional, right? Being very <laughs> intentional, drawing a line in the sand and not... You know, it, it's interesting. I talked to someone just recently who is doing, he's very successful in what he's doing. He's a pharmacist and um, he does a lot of wellness coaching and he's very successful, has a very happy home, very happy marriage, doing really well. He was abused at quite a bit emotionally and physically as a child. He has a brother who came from that same home. He also was physically and emotionally abused. But the brother has been on drugs, has had a pretty miserable life, and they are just two complete opposites in the way that they have embraced their lives. Now, they both came from the same home. They both had choices in how they were going to live out their life. But one chose to draw a line in the sand, just like what Dan and I did with or uh, early on, we were 19 and 20 years old when we got married. And so we, uh, we decided then, at that moment of our unity together, uh, that we were going to draw a line in the sand and not duplicate what we had seen in the past. Lots of divorce and lots of abuse and lots of distance and coolness and not the love and embracing that we wanted to have in our home. I'm glad you bring that out. Uh, well, I think myself included, right? Because I even not really growing up with have a father. And when I saw how my mom uh, was abused, how my grandmother was abused. And well, sad to say, I did walk into that path for a period of that time. Uh, so yeah, exactly. It's just the point of I, I draw the sand, I draw the line in the sand, say enough. I mean, from my generation on, I don't want to pass this on exactly. to my next generation yes. with, with this kind of life. So since we are in this topic, Joanne, you tell in detail that how similar disastrous event in your marriage led to your best education you ever received. Can you share a little bit about that? Yes. Uh, how many years ago now, Dan? About 20... About 28 years ago. 28 years long ago, ago. Long time ago. We were doing, uh, we had a beautiful home, uh, uh, was new when we moved into it, and we had, uh, everything seemed to be going really well, but we had a, a, a changing in banking and a whole lot of things that kind of uh, came together to make it necessary for us to sell a, a, our business at absolute auction. We lost so much money on it. All of a sudden, just in a matter of seconds, we were thrust into... Um, a lot of debt, a lot of debt, hundreds of thousands of dollars of debt, 
and law, uh, the IRS was not happy with us, and you don't mess with the IRS, and we ended up losing our home, losing our cars, losing all of our stuff. So we had a choice to make then. Where are we going to go from there? What, would, what are we going to do to make a living? What are we, where are we going to live? Um, so on and so forth. We ended up moving to Nashville, Tennessee, which was only about an hour from where we had been at that time. And we, start, we started going to a church right away that, um, that was a large church of, a, of about five 6,000 members and in Nashville. And we started a Sunday school class. And it was first career life management, I think it was called. And we, we changed the name uh, through the years. But as it turned out, each, each year it seemed that that Sunday school class kept growing to the extent that other people from other churches were coming just for that class. And we couldn't, it would go on so long we couldn't even get to Sunday school or to church. We couldn't really worship. So we changed it to evening classes at that church and then another church too and had these classes that reached out to the community. Well, because of that, then all of the materials that we had put together little by little became the essence of what now is 48 Days to the Work You Love, which is Dan's best-selling book ever. And that started this whole business, which I am quite convinced would have never happened had we not had that seeming disaster all those years ago where we lost our home and lost everything and felt like we needed to start over. Before that, had absolutely no idea we would ever write books. Since then, Dan has authored, oh, I don't know, half a dozen. Actually, more than that if you count ebooks and all of that kind of stuff. And we have a large business, uh, a great community, a following from all over the world. And I've written uh, several books, uh, adult bo uh, grown-up books, but also five children's books. So we've had so much happen out of that seeming disaster. So I always tell audiences when we're speaking, don't ever underestimate how God can use you in ways that you never expected, even through those disasters. Wow. I mean, you see, from outside, we just look at well, Dan and you is such a successful people, and <laughs> we thought they just got so smart. They oh, just and come up with ideas. Life is and perfect. He no, just, <laughs> he just write all those no. books. They just sit front of their beautiful in a beautiful home, front of the desk, and just no. write all those. And everything just happens. Yes, we become an overnight success, just like all the musicians in in Nashville who become an overnight success after. 20 years of trying to get there, you know? <laughs> exactly. You know, it takes time and effort and intentional living again. Yeah. One of the things that we have as kind of a family motto is when something happens that may be unwelcomed and unexpected, we simply ask, what does this make possible? So instead of seeing, okay, now our dreams have stopped, you know, we have this horrible thing, what does this make possible? And it's experiences like Joanne just described that open our eyes if we really are willing to look for what new direction does this allow? What new opportunities does this present to us that we weren't even aware of before? So and we don't we don't wish for those disasters, believe me. And we certainly don't wish those for anybody else. But usually it's in those times of unexpected circumstances that we do find our greatest opportunity. Yeah. You know, and I am really curious, um, how did you inspire all your children? And you know, because I, when I was studying your bio that I saw Kevin, Jaren, and Ashley, and even one of your granddaughters. Clara. How old, Clara, how old is she? She just turned nine. And then she's co-authoring with you. She <laughs> is. Uh, she, she and I have a new book coming out in October. It's actually on, uh, on Amazon now, so if your listeners look up What If It Were Possible on Amazon, they will see uh, the book that Clara and I wrote together. And she, it, it's, it's a, a sweet, a really cute um, children's book, but it's totally illustrated by Clara. She started in my art class when she was four years old. And she has just, she's a real avid learner. She loves learning. 
and she really listens. She's not your typical eight-year-old who's out there doing all kinds of things. She really wants to learn. And if you say, well, Claire, I'm not sure you know how to do this, she'll say, well, then teach me. And wow. so she's been really good at, at learning her art, and she illustrated all of that book. And it was picked up by Morgan James Publishing, and so it will be, it's available now at my website, joannefmiller.com, in my product section. And she even has her own website now. It's Clara Logston, L-O-G-S-D-O-N dot com. So it's it, it's fun. We're, we're yeah, our kids never really saw anything but the entrepreneurial life, and we. It's not like we ever pushed them into that. It's just that they couldn't see any other way. Yeah, I'm just really. The question is, how did you guys inspire them to pursue their dream? We just taught them how the real world works when they were very young. So when Kevin, our oldest, was 10 years old, BMX became really popular, bicycle motocross. So kids riding bicycles on these little dirt tracks. So he saw what was happening, wanted to get involved, wanted a new bicycle. I said, great, you know, where do we get, get the bicycle? Well, at the bicycle shop, how much is it? It's $400. I said, that's great. How are you going to get that? He's like, well, we're going to go down, and Dad, you're going to write a check. I said, no, that's not the way it works. <laughs> that's a convenience. <laughs> <laughs> but let's figure out a way that you can get that. So I, was in, I had an auto accessories business at the time, and I bought a motorcycle from one of my car dealer friends. And the motorcycle was not in real good shape. So for a month and a half, six weeks, this little 10-year-old boy and his daddy, we worked on that motorcycle. We sanded. We took parts apart had things re-chromed, put things back together carefully, put little pinstripe on there, painted things, made it look beautiful. We set it out in our yard after six weeks. The very first day, first person who looked at it bought it. I took all my money back out that I had put in to buy things along the way, and we had $420 left over. I said, Kevin, here's $420. What do you want to do? I want to go buy that bicycle. So we did. But all along the way, we've helped our children see the way the world works. It's not just mom and dad give me this or the, the government give me this. It's no, if you want that, let's figure out a way to make it work. So our children have come up like that. Jared did bicycle repair when he was just a kid. Ashley would make pies with her mom, take them to school and sell them. And now we've got grandchildren, lots of them, who are doing these things where, you know, Clara, when she was five years old, our, one of our granddaughters wanted a camera, and her parents happened to have just bought a new camera. So they had one that they had been using. It was very adequate for her. But instead of just giving it to her, they said, it's $25. So she had to figure out how she's going to get $25. So she and her Yaya, Joanne, they got together and made poppy seed muffins that she sold at one of our events on our property in, through 48 days and got her $25. But we we haven't tried to push entrepreneurialism on our children and grandchildren, but we just teach them the way the real world works. Do something that has value and people will give you money for that. So it looks like entrepreneurship in many ways. Wow, I'm speechless. So in another words, you know, instead of, you know, some parents say, oh, okay, I want to inspire my kids to be entrepreneur. So they, they kind of say, okay, you should read this book, that book, and stuff like that. But you guys basically show them instead of just, just tell them, but show them how it works. That's a very, very important statement, Kelly, because we felt that, that we needed to be the role models for anything that our children saw whether it's our business or whether it's the respect that we have for one another as a couple or the respect we have for them or for our friends, how we treat people, you know, all that, that trust and honesty and integrity and respect were what they saw every day. If they didn't, when they were real young, they were in school. When they got a little older, I homeschooled, but um, they... They always knew that when they came home, they had a sanctuary to come home to. They had role models that they could emulate that made not only made us 
happy and proud of them, but also made every everybody else out there want to have a part of that too. They wanted, they wanted our children in their homes. They wanted to see how our family works. And it's interesting because we, when we were first learning, when we first got married, we sought out role models. It was very important to us to find people to, that could teach us the ways that we wanted our children to be raised, the way we wanted to be in our marriage, the way we wanted our home to be. Uh, the way we wanted our businesses to be, the, those kinds of things. We looked for specific mentors. Now, that could be a book or conference or it could be a person, whatever. There's a lot of ways to get mentoring. Now, after being married 48 years and having three children, grown children who are entrepreneurial and saving the world in their own ways and all these grandchildren uh, coming into the picture, we're finding that we're now in that role of being mentors for many people. And we take that just as seriously as we took it right at the beginning of our marriage when we needed that. It's very humbling, and we feel quite honored to be in that position. But again, it's time to pay it forward now to give to the community, give to the world all of the things that we needed so much when we were first newly married and what we've learned along the way. Well, I only can say, praise God. <laughs> um, Joanne, I love how you mention your website. You say, I have so many shoes I wear. I love them all. I guess because we, we, women like shoes. Well, women do like shoes, and I will have to say, I certainly am one of those. Uh, I, uh, I have quite a few in my closet, but I also wear a lot of shoes in that I am certainly... First and foremost, well, I should say first and foremost a Christian, obviously, but also my husband comes next, right mm -hmm. under God. And uh, although there were a few days when I thought maybe he was God, but I learned I learned that's not true. I learned that along the way on those some of those bumpy roads, <laughs> as we all do. But uh, we we did take very seriously that Dan and I have to have a great relationship before we can feed everybody else, before we can have that passed on to our children and then passed on to our friends and our community and so forth, it has to start right here in our home, just like Barbara Bush said all those years ago. It starts in our home. It starts with our marriage. And we took that very seriously. And that has, has stemmed out uh, or has been passed on through our children and our grandchildren. I wear a lot of shoes, yes. I wear, I'm Yaya. The, interestingly, I have 14 grandchildren. To seven of them, I am Nana. To seven of them, I am Yaya. So I have to remember even what hat <laughs> I am as a grandmother. <laughs> and um, and I, uh, I'm i a writer and an, art, an author and a blogger and a, a speaker and I'm an artist. And all. so, yeah, I have a lot of hats that I wear. And, um, and I enjoy them all. I really do. I'm not doing anything really that I don't love. I mean, that's incredible. Normally we say that, you know, uh, when we think about wearing shoes, right? Yes. And then we think that when, you know, like rubber meets a road, right? It is. So in the moment we, let's say we change shoes in this analogy, mm -hmm. right? Uh, for me, I personally, I think, you know, when we wear different shoes, the moment like, you know, the spirit, soul, body, you need to shift gear because mm -hmm. between the between the roles, different different roles. So how did you balance it out so beautifully? Well, it's kind of like life. It's not always that easy a transition. But you know, it's interesting that you could that you put it that way, Kelly. I like I like what you're asking because there's a good analogy here. You, I perhaps let's just use my, uh, me as an example. I may be out. Uh, running errands and doing all the things that are necessary to keep a household going. And then I come home and my feet are tired and I change out of the shoes that I'm in. And sometimes I'll put on something much more comfortable, whether it's a slipper or whether it's just a, a real soft soled shoe that just makes me feel different. And then I go about my next task, which could be sitting down and writing a blog 
and then I may get up and for a while I may just want to be barefooted and I'll go clean a toilet or or something but I I you know I I think part of what makes it work too is that I don't get as involved in projecting all of those things that I have to get done in the future I'm concentrating on what do I need to do right now and I take it one step at a time and one at one moment it could be cleaning out a toilet I do clean my own house I don't have somebody else come in and do that I kind of enjoy house cleaning it's cathartic for me but it's also a way to um, get great ideas because most of the time I've cleaned house for a lot of years I don't have to think about it so you know, I, you just take it one thing at a time and then mark that thing off your list and go on to the next. It makes it a lot easier instead of stressing over all of the list that you've got. I, I really like that wisdom of just focus on that moment, that mm -hmm. moment, that role you are in. And uh, yeah, that, that's wisdom right there. So let's talk about entrepreneurial couple life. Okay. <laughs> I yeah, believe that's a roller coaster. <laughs> I believe that behind a successful man, there is a virtuous wife, and behind a successful woman, there is a wise husband. So then, can you share some wisdom with us? How do you balance among all these different roles that husband, father, grandfather, and successful entrepreneur in when come to the co-creating the sanctuary at home? We've always seen the roles that we have as shared roles. It's not that Joanne is responsible for everything at home and I'm responsible for everything at work. We share those things. If I come home and she's had a hard day with the children, yeah, it's my responsibility to spend some time with the children, give her a break. She's wonderful at doing that as well, at recognizing there are times when I do need to be focused on the business. And so she makes it possible for me to do that. But we've never seen ourselves in competition, in competition for time, in competition for the children. It's always been cooperation, working together. And really, that's a principle that carries over into work as well. A lot of people think that to be successful in business, you have to be very competitive. To me, that's a short-sighted view. The real word in business to be successful today is collaboration. So we've collaborated on those roles I want Joanne to be successful. I want her to have these multiple roles that she has where she has success in things other than just being at home. If I come home and dinner's not on the table, but she's in the middle of an art project, that's okay because I want her to have success in those multiple areas as well, things that really give her a sense of fulfillment. I don't want her to be operating just out of a sense of obligation, things that she feels like she has to do. Now, she's done a lot of that, and, and she feels that sense of obligation as well, but we've always supported each other's being our best selves to discover the things that are unique about us and we embrace each other, spending time and effort in developing those things that would open up new opportunities for each of us. You know, there's a principle that is used <clears throat> in selling that we have often used, well, we always have used in our home too. You want everything to be a win-win situation. You don't want it to want anything, whether it's your marriage or your business or, or anything that you're doing, to be I win, you lose. Mm -hmm. Because somebody's going to get hurt in that process. If it isn't, if we can't uh, come to a, a, a decision on something where we both feel good about it, then somebody's losing in that. So we have to talk it through until we have come to a reasonable conclusion that satisfies both of us. It may not be ideal for both of us, but it has to satisfy both of us before we then go forward. Because if it doesn't, then somebody's going to get depressed, angry, bitter, whatever. And that doesn't help any relationship. You know, there, there's, I, I had uh, a moment in the book where I said um, something, I can't remember, I used some example that Dan had, had done, and he, he said, and, and I've, quoted Dan, he says, why would I crap in my own nest? And that's the truth. We do that so often. We, we do things that just jeopardize our own relationship or the happiness or health of our home because we just want to be right. And we have a motto in our home that 
for many years was on the front of our refrigerator door that says practice being kind instead of right. Wow. And I really truly believe that. I don't care what the circumstances or who you're working with or who you're talking to, practice being kind instead of right. That's that's so good. Now I feel I have moments of guilty guilty moments in my own marriage. <laughs> We just said it for 18 years. Well, one of the things that I'm really encouraging people to do when they read my book, Creating a Haven of Peace, is to read it together as a couple. Because there are questions in there and, and steps in there and statements in there that I think bear discussing as a couple. And in doing so, I really firmly believe that changes can be made. Just Sometimes it's a little tweak here and there. Little changes that can be made to make your home the happy home that you want it to be. And none of us set out to have an unhappy home. We want that happiness. We want that togetherness. We want that sanctuary, that place of immunity that we can come to no matter what and know that we are unconditionally loved, embraced no matter what the situation is. And yes, we have gone through losing our house and losing our cars and losing our stuff. And we've gone through the drug abuse of one of our children who almost uh, killed himself several times. We've gone through um, all kinds of things that happen along the way. We have had health issues. I'm, I have a diagnosis of multiple sclerosis that happened 17 years ago. Uh, so, and that's not something that's curable. It's something that I don't let define my life, but it is something that I do have to take care of myself for. So there's things that we have had just like every other couple. It's not like we've been immune from those things. But what did we do to gain a new perspective on every situation to make it work for us instead of against us? Wow. I know I say a lot of wow <laughs> in this interview because I, I'm, I'm literally speechless. Um, but please do tell us you guys do have a moment of argument, right? Because by now, probably all the listeners think, my goodness, they are such a, a couple of, uh, you know, like a perfect couple. We haven't heard anything that they argue for a moment mm. in their 48 years. So please do oh, tell us. Oh, I can us. tell you some. <laughs> <laughs> I can certainly tell you some. In fact, this is what first popped into my mind when you said that. This was not that many years ago. I'm trying to think how many years, probably. Um, five or six years ago or something, Dan and I uh, were having a discussion about something. He came in to, the, to my studio and he sat down and he just says, well, I don't even know how to talk to you anymore because you might end up crying or angry or, or whatever. And I said, yeah, really? I said, get used to it. I'm a woman. I have emotions. I am not Dan Miller. I do cry. I do get angry. And sometimes it just takes me a while to get over something. But I said, that doesn't change things between us. I don't love you less. I am a woman. So learn to accept that. And I think he was speechless at the moment, if I remember correctly. But uh, yes, we certainly have our arguments. And quite, and quite honestly, I was very proud of myself for standing up for myself in that way. <laughs> But um, there, we, Dan, I will have to say, has never raised his voice to me, ever. Now, I'm not going to say that I haven't raised my voice. I was raised in a very different home environment where my mother did a lot of yelling and screaming and hitting and, and a lot of abuse in, in many ways. Uh, I didn't want to emulate that, and sometimes I have to check myself. Okay, wait a minute, I'm not my mom. I don't have to respond in that way. Uh, but we don't. I, I, I talked in the book about how to fight. We don't fight. Dan and I don't fight. I, we argue, do we argue? I don't even like that word. I don't like the terminology we use. We have some intense discussions. Let's put it that way. That's much but better. we can talk about it and we can get through it because why wouldn't we want to? If we don't, then we're building up resentment, anger, bitterness, I've, I've had moments of doing that, years of doing that. It's taken a lot of self-evaluation, reading a lot, uh, and do, doing my own therapy, 
to be able to make sure that I don't just stuff and make myself sick over something, but that I, we do sit down and talk about it. So there are, there's certainly, yeah, do we fight? No. Do we have intense discussion? Sure. But most of the time we can sit down and discuss something like normal. Well, I don't want to say normal. I don't think we're normal. <laughs> but like uh, most human beings, we can sit down and talk and get through it. Well, I'm, I'm kind of a big picture guy. If I'm looking at my business, I don't want to do something now that is going to cause a problem farther down the road. Or if I'm driving a car, I like cars. If I'm driving a car and the tire's flat, I'm not gonna get out and just kick the tire and scream at the car because the tire's flat. I'm gonna fix it. And in a relationship, I think I look at things in the same way. I very quickly go to, what is this going to cause a week from now or a month from now or a year from now? I don't want to just make the problem worse. I want to immediately look for what is going to make things better. And I take that approach to it. So I, I don't understand your know, relationships that go for weeks and months on end where people are angry at each other. I mean, we, we certainly have used the biblical principle, let not the sun go down upon your wrath. I mean, we've, we've tried to make sure we end every day peacefully um, and have been pretty successful at that. I think through the years. And that's 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 very inspiring from both of you. Um now I think by now we all should go to grab your books regardless. <laughs> but I guess just for a sake of the question, I'm gonna ask this. Tell us, Joanne, who should read this book and why? Well, it would be real easy to say, well, everybody needs to read this book. Um, and, and I think there's some truth in that because if you're a married, especially if you're in any kind of a relationship, it's a, it's a very relationship book. And like I said, I think couples need to read it together and I, they, it will give a lot of food for thought, a lot of good discussion material, a lot of fodder for, for great discussions. But I also really believe, and I've seen this in action already with people who are reading the book that young couples who are wanting to start out with a home that they can be proud of, one that will last through the years, will last 48 years and more, um, th those young couples can really benefit a lot from what I've written in the book. But I also think, and I, I, this is a quote from Dan Miller, that it's never too late for a new beginning. And I think that anyone of any age will benefit in reading this because there are steps you can take to make your marriage better, to make your home more peaceful, more beautiful. And it doesn't take a lot of money or a lot of time. It just takes consistency and intentional living. Yeah, intentional living indeed. So, I mean, we can just sit here whole day long <laughs> with this conversation, but... You know, I mean, Dan and John, they are so gracious. Actually, today they have a day trip in uh, in London, and uh, I don't want to take much of their time, but I do want to ask the last question. Like, what is your godly MBA moment? Meaning the moment you realize that, you know, both of you, that your business, uh, your content out there uh, is not just for your business. The way our business developed, it kind of happened in spite of us. We'd gone through a really rough period of time, and then just as an act of service to our church and community, started teaching a Sunday school class, helping other people understand these inevitable career transitions and challenges we have. My dad was a pastor. I never dreamed of doing something in the church that would be part of my generating income. That was strictly ministry. But the needs were so great, and as Joanne mentioned, we started having people come from other churches and other states that grew and grew and grew to where I was being asked 20, 30 hours a week to work with people to help them through these things. And we finally realized, and it was with some guidance from Joanne on this, that this was God's opportunity for provision for our family as well as ministry. And to blend those two, that was a real MBA moment. 
to realize this was not just ministry. This was also provision for our family. And it just opened the floodgates. It was like an explosion when I realized that those two could be blended together. I think our lives need to be ministry in everything we're doing. So often as Christians, we think you're in ministry if you're in Africa or Haiti or somewhere off into a foreign country working with the poor or whatever your mission you think that your ministry should be or that your ministry is behind a pulpit. Every day our lives is a min our, our ministry. We can be ministering through our business and should be ministering through our business or through our work if it's a, a, a regular job, uh, through our families, through our friendships, through our community. We are all in ministry and we take that very seriously. And when we started seeing how our ministry could be a, a, a bread, uh, uh, earning our bread and butter also, and taking care of our family, that was such a blessing. And I think that that's the way we need to view our lives. We are all in ministry every day of our lives. Well, this cannot be better. And I just cannot help to mention that in Joanne's book, actually, you know, she mentioned about how, you know, our work, you know, it doesn't matter your job or your business. Actually, it's a form of prayer. And, and then for myself, it is the same. It's, mm -hmm. it's like, you know, in the Bible say we pray always. Exactly. Right. And then one day I kind of ask God, say, how on the earth I can pray always? If we, 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 if we really think of prayer, just kind of put your hands up and then get to kneel down on the floor in certain form. Yes. But actually, each single moment when we take breath, it's a form. I, a I heard a, I heard a sermon on that many, many years ago about how, to, how our whole life needs to be a prayer. That really spoke to me. I don't have to bow my head, fold my hands, and close my eyes and think specifically on anything to be a prayer. I hope and pray that my life is a prayer every single day, every single moment. I want to thank you so much again for both of your times and the wisdom. Um, you know, I believe today you have really inspired all of us to Remember the core success is then from what happens in our home. Thank you so much. You are welcome. Thank you for allowing us the opportunity. It's been a delight talking with you, Kelly. Thank you. Thank you so much for watching. If you have enjoyed the video, would you please share your feedback with us by liking, commenting, sharing, subscribing to the channel so we know how we can do a better job for the next video. You know, all these little actions or feedback actually serve as a huge dose of blessing to us. Thanks again, and I will see you in the next video.